So um, with that, let me just uh, um, you know do the same thing we did the last time we were doing exam review. I'll just try to list out the topics that I think you need to know. And whatever I can't remember must not be all that important. <laughs> um, so let's see. So exam three review. And the biggest portion of that is quantum mechanics. And I guess uh, to be explicit, maybe I should say wave mechanics. Because um, we are not uh, talking about black body radiation. We are not talking about photoelectric effect. We are talking about the actual machinery of quantum mechanics, Schrodinger equation, which is wave equation. So to emphasize that, I'll just say wave mechanics. That doesn't mean I want you to forget about all the, um, all the um, kind of intuitive basics that we covered in chapter six. You should still remember those intuitive basics. So let me just uh, spell out what those intuitive basics from chapter six that you ought to remember are. It really starts with, in our context, De Broglie relationship that momentum is related to the wavelength by h over lambda. And in the context of wave mechanics, we can actually expand, then expand on this a little bit more. That momentum is given by h bar times wave number. And the reason I prefer this form over this in wave mechanics is because of the hint at the, the operator form of the momentum. The momentum operator is h bar over i partial derivative with respect to position. Or technically, this is the x momentum operator. If you're talking about the y or the z component of momentum, this will be y or z. Yeah? So this reaches all the way back to chapter 6, because you know, this was chapter 6 material. But Having the good intuition is important for how well can you use the mathematical machinery. Good. And the other thing that we covered was energy. So um, energy, uh, as a, it came up as a, people were doing photoelectric effect or whatnot, is the quantized energy is Planck's constant times frequency, or the version I prefer is h bar times omega, because this is the form that's more commonly in mathematical expressions. And once again, this is hinting at the operator form of energy, which is um, the energy operator is, is there a minus? No, no minus. Uh, I h bar partial derivative with respect to time. Okay. Let's see, what else do you need to remember from chapter six? Um, I guess it's just the one big thing. The uncertainty principle was in chapter six, right? Was it? Huh. No, it was in chapter, huh, it was in chapter seven. All right, um, so let me do it this way. <laughs> um, so uncertainty principle at our level, it's more of an intuitive uh, principle than something that we are going to um, do a lot of, uh, do a lot of technical complicated calculations with. So let me just put uncertainty principle under this rubric. And I know some of you have read about energy time uncertainty principle um, and were answering some questions based on that. Let's see, where do I want to leave it? I think I actually do want to include it for this exam. Um, in fact, you will see energy time uncertainty principle used for um, some, some of the particle physics stuff because that's how, that's how W boson mass is determined by use of energy time uncertainty principle. They can determine the, the lifetime of the W boson based on the resonance picture. And from that lifetime, they infer a mass of, wait, is that? Something like that. <laughs> anyway, so let me just spell out the uncertainty principles. Um, uncertainty principle. Um, oh, actually, it works the other way. Let me just. So the one that we, you guys actually had to know for 
exam two, and that's the basic uncertainty principle. It's the one involving momentum and uh, position. That difference, the uncertainty in momentum times uncertainty in position is greater than or equal to h bar over two. And um, this is something I, okay, I guess I've never written an exam question that looks like this. But this is only my second time teaching this class, so I could actually write one a question that you can do. If I were to, <laughs> then this is an actual detailed calculation you can do. Because these uh, delta P and delta X, they can be precisely defined as the standard deviation. Meaning, uh, I'm gonna erase this in a bit, delta P squared. Really what that is is, um, so standard deviation squared or variance. So it'll be uh, take the momentum of, for some i thing, subtract out the average momentum, right? Take this, squared, and then average it again. That gives you the variance. And I guess I can just stop there. And when you go through some simple kind of statistical or algebra with the statistics in mind, what this simplifies into is expectation value of momentum squared, momentum squared minus square of the expectation value of momentum. Can you see the difference? Yes? Or in other words, in the simple case, like with the, um, the infinite square well, <laughs> that's the context where I'm thinking about this, just thinking out loud. In the context where average momentum is zero, essentially this uncertainty squared is the expectation value of momentum squared. So, um, so with that in mind, you could actually express this something like this expectation value of momentum squared times expectation value of position squared is greater than or equal to h bar squared over four. And um, so, so, so that's why I, be, I have been emphasizing this momentum position uncertainty more. It's something that's actually accessible at your level. Um, not as a simply, you know, this is approximately greater than or equal to, but like you can do an exact calculation and show that for under certain minimum uncertainty configuration, this equality is actually met. And that there's no other, no situation where um, you can go below that minimum uncertainty. And, but um, because you are, you may be using this for some of the particle physics stuff, let me just uh, spell it out. There's the energy time uncertainty principle. And this is something you will see when you take upper division quantum mechanics. The, um, despite their kind of apparent similarity, the mathematical base, or basis of it is very different. So this the energy um, times delta T is greater than or equal to H bar over two. And I don't know how your textbook drives it. Um, so what I will say is that uh, assigning meaning to these are easy because momentum is a physical observable. It's a quantity you can measure. The, the position is also physical observable. It's something you can measure. So you get uncertainty on those measurables, then you get that. Energy is a measurable, that's fine. Time is not a measurable. So here really the biggest uh, difficulty you would run into, well, not difficulty, uh, the subtlety that I want you to be careful with, that's why I didn't deal with this at all, is the subtlety of dealing correctly with the delta T. And what I will tell you is that in the context that you will be using it for particle physics, this delta T will always be lifetime of an unstable particle. And at least that's one meaning of delta T that's not wrong. No, that's, that's not wrong. Yeah, that is not wrong. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so this is something that you may see on your exam. Um, in a very minor context, it wouldn't be, because particle physics already is only like 30% of your exam, and I don't want to waste <laughs> too much of the 30% on this. All right.
Yeah. So these are more intuitive stuff where you are not solving any differential equations, you are not doing anything that's super difficult other than some hint <laughs> at the upcoming differential equations. So that's why this is the chapter six material. This is something that should sound familiar to you, if not, you know, review it or something. But the bulk of your exam will be on wave mechanics, or rather the way to describe it is, it starts with the Schrodinger equation. And in fact, I would say the time independent Schrodinger equation. Because when it comes down to wave mechanics, it's really going to be the energy eigenstates, the um, energy eigenstates that I can actually ask you about. So I would say your biggest focus ought to be on the time independent, independent Schrodinger equation. Um, I guess you could do it with a time dependent Schrodinger equation, but I think it's a big enough of a pretension on our part to, to pretend that you guys know fully well how to solve ordinary, ordinary differential equations. Like some of you do, but like all that we do in this class to solve ordinary differential equations, we guess a solution and check. <laughs> I think that's big enough of a pretension that if we start doing time dependent to Schrodinger equation, then we have to pretend that you guys know how to deal with the PDEs, partial differential equations. And I think that's an upper division level math. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> um, so the time independent Schrodinger equation, it looks like this. Uh, minus h bar squared over 2m, the double position derivative, ordinary derivatives, because <laughs> that's the whole point of doing time independent version, of the wave function, just the position for portion. Um, I, yeah, I guess I've mentioned how the time dependence for this goes, but I don't think I'm ever going to test you on it. Um, so, I mean, you know, we've, I have mentioned this, that when you have an energy eigenstate, when you have a stationary state, that the full wave function, including the time dependence of this stationary state, is given by, as a function of position and time, the position wave function times this very simple, e to the minus i e over h bar t. Like I've mentioned this, right? And, um, yeah, there are things we can do, but um, I don't think I've built up this semester quite well along that line, so I, I won't test you on this. So we'll just stick with the time independent Schrodinger equation. Um, but you know, if you were ever to take the upper division quantum mechanics, then this is something that I want you to be ready to come back to and deal with. This can be actually be used. If you have two um, double well configuration, you can use this to kind of illustrate um, moving of a particle from one well to the other, back and forth. You have to do it as a superposition of two energy eigenstates. One, so anyways, uh, we haven't done much of that. Uh, maybe next time I teach this class again, we'll do some simulations or something, but not this class. <laughs> um, so, so you're dealing with uh, just the position uh, wave function plus the potential times the position wave function is equal to energy as a scalar value, not the energy operator, which will give you the time derivative, but the eigenvalue. So we are kind of already implying we are dealing with the energy eigenstate. So an eigenvalue times the <coughs> wave function. Okay. So that's the time independent Schrodinger equation. That's really the centerpiece of chapter seven. And what I would tell you is you should know uh, how to solve it. Not for every situation. Uh, you should know how to solve it for constant potential. Or to be more correct, you should know how to solve it for piecewise constant potential. That's really where we ended the chapter seven with. That was your, uh, you know, the chapter seven problems at sea. <laughs> Some of you are still working on. Um, so in your textbook, it's covered here. But because your textbook does it as quantum tunneling through a potential barrier, which is very complicated, I'm 
never really going to ask you the, the detailed quantum tunneling question because um, if you, there's not enough time during the exam for you to actually do the calculation. If I'm just giving you the formula, I'm just asking you to use a very complicated formula. I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I want you to be able to do is half of quantum tunneling, as in deal with a step up potential or deal with a step down potential. Um, so uh, you will see that it, you, you saw that reflected on chapter seven problems at C. And you will see that when you look at the post sample exam, you will see that reflected there also. So, um, so um, but it does uh, kind of boil down to, you should know how to solve this uh, time independent Schrodinger actually solve it. Um, well, okay, I guess you're still guessing exponentials as a solution, but actually solve for the particular solution by applying boundary conditions um, for piecewise constant um, potential. And this also includes things like infinite square well. Um, it could include a finite square well, but I want to because once again, it's mathematically too complicated. Um, and because that's not the only thing that's described here, you should also know how to solve this. Uh, not how to solve, you should know how to apply it, you should know how to use it, or better way of describing it, you should know how to verify a given solution. A good example that you may not have had a lot of practice doing, I think there were some questions on it, is the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator potential is complicated enough that I won't ever expect you to solve it. The solution to this is not a simple exponential. <laughs> it's like a Gaussian exponential times a polynomial. <laughs> so, um, but what I can expect you to do is if I give you a solution, either for ground state or maybe one of the excited states, if I want to make it more complicated. Think of for homework, you did it for ground state, right? Yes? And, the first state. and did I do it for first excited state too? Yeah, for ground and the yeah. so for something like that, because once it gets to the third and fourth, then you are dealing with the polynomial of multiple terms, it takes too long. But for those first few states, I should be able to give it to you, tell you to, demonstrate, prove that it is a solution and find the eigenvalue or something. Not, no, not find the eigenvalue or verify that this given, this given eigenvalue is an actual eigenvalue. So that's a level of calculus that I think you should be able to do for this class. Um, so that's what I mean, verify a given solution. Um, let's see, what else about time independent Schrodinger equation that I haven't mentioned? Um, they could, you know, there's a lot that's covered under these two umbrella, <laughs> but that kind of covers it. Um, let's just see. Oh, I think, um, um, so it falls under this overall bigger umbrella. Uh, what it should be is that um, using the wave function and any operators that you know, like the position, no, momentum, and position operators. So position operator is actually very simple. It's just multiplication by x in position space. Um, yeah. There's something called the momentum space, which you saw a hint of in the, the FAT simulation lab, but I'm not, never going to ask you a question in momentum space, because that's more of Fourier transform all that. I guess we are never doing Fourier transformation. Um, you can study that on your own. <laughs> um, um, so using the position, the, using the wave function and operators, let me just use this symbol for operator, using wave function and operators, compute uh, measurable quantities. So measurable quantities would be either eigenvalue, so in that case, whatever function I gave you better be an eigenfunction. If it's not, then it doesn't have an eigenvalue. Or in a more general case, you should be able to calculate the expectation value. And that's the kind of calculation that would uh, actually tie with calculation of this type. Because what's involved here is the expectation value. 
And so this is actual detailed calculation. And I think um, it's a, so you know, when you calculate expectation value, it is going to involve an integral. So depending on how complicated the integral is, I may need to give you integral table. But um, so this is the up, at the upper range of the detailed calculation that you need to be able to do for this class. Yep. Um, all right. I feel like I missed something from chapter seven. Um, mentioned uncertainty principle. So tunneling, I guess that's it.